You have acquaintances and you have those you consider a friend. In this case, a friend is someone that you can trust to talk about private and personal matters. There are rooms in your home where you hold personal and private things. And although you invite an acquaintance to your home for a get together, you wouldn't allow them behind the doors of secrecy. Why? Because they may share what they heard or saw behind those doors with someone you don't consider a friend. While some may consider their lives an open book, others have been harmed by misrepresentation of information spread by others. If only I hadn't told them what I was thinking to do that night, then they wouldn't have this opportunity to judge me. Well, what if I were to tell you that God too has those he considers an acquaintance and others who he considers his friend? And God has a house, and in his house he has two doors. One door leads to the house of prayer, where everyone is welcome, and the other door is a door of secrecy, where private and personal matters are spoken and heard. People are hasty to become your friend, but do you consider them your friend? Believers often make the mistake of dismissing their own set of values for the sake of others, thus allowing people to make them their friends instead of them choosing who they perceive to be a trustworthy friend. As believers, we have a code of ethics and a code of conduct which we live by, like do what's right, not to judge a matter quickly, to forgive one another, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. These qualities are a good basis to build any relationship on. But all too often, we as believers have been misled to think that our values we expect others to have are unattainable. But more on that later. The question we need to ask ourselves is, what makes a good friend? In John chapter 15 and verse 12, it states, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So through the process of time, we learn who our true friends are, based on their trustworthiness as well as their works. There's confidence in knowing someone's willingness to defend you. And although there are some that may even go as far as to fight for you, they may find it difficult to conceal a private matter. There's many reasons for this occurrence. Said persons may either value drama more than your friendship, or they don't value their lives as much as you thought. Or is it possible that we're placing too much weight on our earthly relationships in hopes of replicating the quintessential relationship found with God. In Romans chapter 5, verses 10 to 11, it states, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We hear it all the time. I want someone who will stand beside me through thick and thin. I want someone to love me no matter what. I want him or her to love me for who I am. Pause. No one knows you better than God. And on that note, why haven't we spent more time solidifying our relationship with God that already possesses those qualities? The best relationships thrive because of ample communication, not just one or two days of it, but throughout the whole week. The Word of God is another way God speaks to us, and it's normal for us to respond to God through prayer. God, help me to fulfill what you said. God, let it be less of me and more of thee. John chapter 15 verse 15 says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You see, we have considered God our friend. But what does he consider us? It may come as a surprise to many of us that we don't start out as friends of God, but rather his enemy. Enemy in the sense of our rebellion towards him. Acts chapter 9 verse 5 speaks of Saul's encounter with Jesus Christ, as it states, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, 
I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Could you imagine God pleading with you not to sin? Because it hurts him to see that you're hurting yourself. Yet, you continue to hurt yourself. So, out of love, God will separate himself from you until you come to realize your worth. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. You see, sin separates us from God. So many will say, well, nothing could separate us from God. And that's right, nothing should. Yet, there are many that fall victim to a lifestyle of sin, which means that they no longer want that meaningful relationship with God. And as the scripture, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 states, concerning the rewards of sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Interesting in itself is how the flesh characterizes a friend much differently than the spirit. Making a distinguishment between the flesh and the spirit is paramount when bettering the likelihood of a lasting relationship. But, I would like everyone to know that a healthy mix is not bad. Just ensure the factors of the spirit are more desired than the characteristics of the flesh. The flesh is attracted to a relationship that yields more excitement and spontaneity, while the spirit values more of the characteristics held by God. This includes, but is not limited to, humbleness, trustworthiness, as well as meekness. You may have encountered a time within your life when you've lowered your expectation of what a friend should be, just so you could have someone to call a friend, right? Not a shocker. Yet, some have applied the same ideology when choosing a significant other. Big shocker. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So holding on to our values is the uppermost importance. The initial excitement and desire may dwindle in a regular relationship. But as the scripture details, our excitement, desire, as well as our drive should match if not be greater than the feelings felt at the beginning of our relationship with God. The greatest struggle we'll encounter in life is between the flesh and the spirit. Because the weightiness of what the flesh wants to commit versus what the spirit wants to pursue. For peace, many would give into the flesh and lose their chance of a lasting relationship with God, which is why in life, the race is a race of endurance. Who can outlast the lust of the flesh? And since we're on the topic of this race we call life, churches spend a lot of time describing the benefits of the first door into God's house, the house of prayer. For one, there's a low bar of entry where everyone is welcome. And secondarily, it places less down pressure on the constituents of the church to talk about the weightier matters of God, like remarriage and abortion. Although the second door has a higher bar of entry, there is insight given to help one level up, all while they are serving God. And it's not that God is withholding information that can better you, but Wisdom is not perceived as wisdom to a person comfortable in their current state of mind and living situation. So God has to wait for you to acknowledge that you really want a relationship with him and thus want more out of the relationship before he could proceed to fill you with more. And it's needful for me to add that the problem of keeping one excited along their journey with God is not an issue to those who gain acceptance through the second door. Their desire to serve God continues to burn hotter with time. Earlier, when I said misinformation can hurt people, I meant it. Bitterness plus no hope mixed with truth can be used as a weapon of destruction towards one that is starting their journey to serve God. An example of this is found in conversations between an unbeliever who wants to serve God for the first time and an experienced believer that has fallen into a lifestyle of sin. You will never amount to what God wants you to be because stumbling blocks exist to make you falter. Now, this message is taken out of context, but the message hits home when considering how upset a fallen believer becomes when they hear of anyone's attempt to pursue God. 
This fallen believer will stop at nothing to dissuade the beginner from pursuing God because of their animosity they hold toward their past failures. The more information about God this fallen believer would have received is more ammunition to an already hurting soul, which is why some won't gain entry into the second door. You have acquaintances and you have those you consider a friend. There are rooms in your home where you hold personal and private things. God too has those he consider an acquaintance and others who he considers his friend. And God has a house and in his house he has two doors. One door leads to a house of prayer where everyone is welcome and the other door is a door of secrecy where private and personal matters are spoken and heard. God has a wealth of wisdom he'd like to share with you, and gifts of the Spirit he'd like for you to attain. But if we remain at the base of the mountain, struggling with sin, arguing with clear guidelines on how we should live an abundant life, then we may even forget how needful it is to take our ascent up that mountain. The word is described as a two-edged sword, and although the initial application of the word to your life may hurt, it's necessary. There's a life of struggling, and then there's a life of peace. Either way, you have to face life. Choose wisely. God bless.